This is actually a really exciting time in the history of hydrogen and, and fuel cell technologies, um, which are actually not as well known as some of the other technologies like solar and wind and batteries. And in fact, when I moved to DOE almost roughly 13 years ago, I moved from industry, and I told people I'm moving from industry to government, and um, some people thought I was moving to NIH. And I was always very perplexed, and I was wondering, why are they thinking of moving to NIH? And then I realized they thought fuel cells were the same as stem cells. <laughs> and so um, thanks for this opportunity to spread the word and, and educate people. Thank you all for your interest. So going back to the beginning of the fuel cell program um, at DOE, it started in the 1970s during the first oil embargo when a group of scientists, um, industry, government, DOE managers got together at Los Alamos and looked at, you know, how can we get off foreign oil? And that was the beginning. Um, scientists developed and optimized what's known as the fuel cell electrodes, the heart of the fuel cell system. Um, you can see the, the cars here, very early version. Um, a lot of people don't know that GM, General Motors, relocated um, part of their f staff to Los Alamos to work on hydrogen and fuel cell technology. And 40 years later, we have commercial fuel cell cars in the market. So how many of you have seen the, the fuel cell cars? Okay, great. Um, and so, uh, great, great progress. And um, thank you all. There are many people worldwide who've made this happen. So the bottom line is we have power, performance, and completely pollution-free. So these cars can refuel in minutes. Um, we have more than 300-mile driving range. The latest model that just came out has 366 miles on just one fill. Um, more, uh, one of the models has a 66-mile-per-gallon equivalent fuel economy and very high power. They're all electric uh, drive, no conventional transmission, pistons, gears, and so forth. So um, straight from a standing start, you get very high torque, very high acceleration, and all completely uh, pollution-free. So no no criteria pollutants, no CO2, only water vapor. In fact, this bottle is um, exhaust uh, from, the, from the car. And in my previous job, one of my previous jobs, in fact, working in industry where uh, we use fuel cells for space applications, the astronauts actually can drink the water coming out of the fuel cell, so completely clean technology. And uh, we actually have a couple of the world's first commercial cars here now in the DOE building or in the garage. And we have, um, so this was the first time we have a federal agency, an agency that actually has commercial fuel cell cars um, here. So how does it work? Um, when you step on the gas pedal, um, you'll have fuel that flows in on one side of the fuel cell. Um, and I have a sample here. This is the heart of the fuel cell. Um, and then you have air that comes in the other side. And we have basically no combustion. You're not burning. Uh, we have a pretty archaic system now. We waste a lot of that energy content in the fuel as just heat. Uh, but you produce electricity directly, simple, simple version here. And you, the oxygen from the air combines with um, part of the hydrogen to produce water. So we have been funding this at DOE for um, decades, as you know. And just to give you an idea, we have um, optimized this heart of the fuel cell. So this size is about enough to power a light bulb, so you can get an idea of how much power you can get. And you can stack these. So these are modular, scalable. They're small enough to power your laptop, your cell phone. They're large enough. Um, in a typical car, you might have 300 of these. It replaces the engine. It's just about this big. Um, and the largest fuel cell in the world is now in Korea, 60 megawatts or so. So very large to provide power for industrial applications. And again, no combustion, direct electrical production, and so much more efficient, over twice as efficient compared to today's gasoline um, vehicles. So what about hydrogen? So um, if we go back to oops, um, hydrogen, hydrogen actually is uh, the most abundant element in the universe. I think most people are aware 75% of the known mass of the universe is hydrogen. Um, it also has 
uh, the highest, one of the highest energy contents of all uh, known fuels. It's actually three times more than gasoline, but that's on a mass or a weight basis. It's a, it's a light, very light gas. So if you look on a volume basis, it's actually worse than gasoline. Gasoline has a lot of energy density by volume. But hydrogen is not found uh, easily free in, in nature. You have to produce that hydrogen. And so it's an energy carrier. It's not a source. But you can produce it from diverse domestic resources, so natural gas, coal gasification, nuclear heat, um, renewables, obviously, and you can use it in a number of applications. So we talked about fuel cells, but can, you can use it today. Petroleum refining and fertilizer production are their largest uses of hydrogen, but in food processing, even cosmetics, it's basically a, a very well-known chemical commodity. And if you look at where we produce hydrogen, we already produce more than 10 million metric tons per year, uh, mostly from uh, reforming uh, natural gas. We have more than 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipeline. A lot of people don't realize that. You can see almost every state actually has large central hydrogen production facilities. In terms of hydrogen stations, there are now 25 retail, completely retail stations. You can go pay with a credit card. Um, and 12 to 25 plant in the Northeast, about 100 um, in the works in California right now. So we, we talked about hydrogen. It takes energy to produce hydrogen. Um, but because the fuel cell is so much more efficient, um, the total well-to-wheels or life cycle greenhouse gas emissions is what we really need to look at. We don't overhype the hydrogen and, and fuel cell advantages, and we look at the total um, energy that it takes and emissions from producing, delivering, storing, and then converting that hydrogen to fuel. So um, we, across the offices at DOE, continue to update these analyses. This is hot off the press, just one snapshot in time, because this will continue to evolve. But we look at all the different technologies that are now uh, out in the market. These are some examples. And look at the range. So today's conventional gasoline vehicle gives you about 450 grams of CO2 per mile to give you a baseline. And then we look at the range of CO2 per mile for all of these different technologies. So you can see they're all uh, beneficial. They're all on the road. And we're already starting to reduce our total life cycle emissions. And now, for the first time in history, we have commercial fuel cell cars on the road. And even if you produce that hydrogen from natural gas, we get this question all the time, you still have uh, total well-to-wheels emission, because there's zero uh, carbon from the tailpipe. Um, reduction of about 50%. And then, of course, as you go to renewables, California requires 33% renewables. Now you can see that we're continuing to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So of course, the big question is cost. So uh, let me quickly cover the cost status. And we have a number of technical targets. So the bottom line is we have to get be competitive with other technologies. So whether it's the fuel cell, uh, $40 per kilowatt is our target, whether it's the hydrogen, in this case $4 per kilogram, and you might see kilogram or gallon gasoline equivalent used interchangeably because it just so happens, a coincidence of nature, that one kilogram of hydrogen has the same energy content as one gallon of gasoline. So unlike other ethanol or others where you have to do a calculation, um, it's, it's this, roughly the same. And then for hydrogen storage as well, these, the hydrogen is stored in tanks on board the vehicle. They go through bonfire, gunfire, drop testing, crash testing, uh, very um, extensively tested for, for safety, obviously. And so let's look at where we are today compared to where we need to be. So we have, um, depending on the volume, and Mark talked about manufacturing, which is really critical, so we have to increase the volume and market penetration. So at low volumes, you know, there aren't very many systems out there, um, only about over a thousand or so commercial cars now um, in the US, but so you can see the cost is low, is, is still much too high. Same with the hydrogen at the station, same with the hydrogen storage. If we can get the volume, get mass market penetration, we get closer to our targets and we keep um, continuing to make progress. So we need to get volume and we need to get market penetration. So what's very exciting, just in the last couple of years, we have buses now, um, 
a fleet, especially in California, over 15 million passengers. So these are in passenger service. We have uh, forklifts in the last a uh, couple of years as well. Over 10,000 we're tracking. Major companies, Walmart, Coca-Cola, FedEx, are using hydrogen fuel cell forklifts. Of course, zero emissions inside warehouses is one big driver, and um, you know millions of hydrogen refuelings. Um, I mentioned uh, Walmart, Coca-Cola, FedEx. Uh, one of the fuel cell developers said that every 12 seconds, one of their customers is refueling with hydrogen. So we're getting uh, lots of real-time um, experience. And uh, also hot off the press, the Super Bowl had a fuel cell mobile lighting unit instead of a diesel generator that was providing light. So early markets um, we're seeing, and then Germany just announced plans for the world's first hydrogen fuel cell train um, that was supposed to be in passenger service next year. Japan is one of the major leaders. Um, I was actually here uh, a while ago. This is the world's largest town, Fukuoka, running on hydrogen. They have a hydrogen pipeline um, coming from a steel plant. I walked over this street, by the way, and a museum with um, a fuel cell. They have apartment building with fuel cells, a station, a bus, vehicles. So uh, regional deployments. And besides transportation, uh, fuel cells are making headway in the stationary sector as well. So critical loads, such as uh, banks, credit card companies, uh, supermarkets. Twice already this has happened to me, where I was at a grocery store and all the lights went out. Um, so in terms of perishable loads, uh, grid resiliency, we're seeing fuel cells take off. And the new World Trade Center is going to have over 4 megawatts of fuel cells powered by natural gas. So you don't have to use hydrogen. You can use a number of different fuels. And this just gives you an idea, again, of electrical efficiency. So there are a number of different technologies uh, from EPA. This shows you, again, the benefit, uh, one of the benefits of fuel cells with very high efficiency conversion of fuel to electricity. So uh, we publish an annual report every year, which tracks the growth. You can see steady growth in hydrogen, in fuel cell technologies over the years. Um, 60,000 fuel cells were shipped worldwide in 2015. Most of this is in this green area in the stationary sector. And people are usually surprised to learn that it's small residential fuel cells. Most of those are in Japan, over 170,000 major companies like Panasonic, Toshiba. These fuel cells, especially since Fukushima, provide power for the home. They run on natural gas and provide hot water. So we're seeing a growing market um, in hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. Now, the big question is hydrogen infrastructure. So I'm going to end with a couple of comments there and talk about what, what can we learn from history if we look at infrastructure. So if you go to um, gasoline, in the late 1800s, we had a vast infrastructure for kerosene for lamps. And when we moved to electric lighting, that kerosene infrastructure became available for gasoline. And we had um, cans, barrels. You see this guy getting gasoline out of this barrel. Um, we had pharmacies, general stores, where you could actually go and, and buy a little bit of gasoline. So it was widely available, many diverse options. And this guy is riding his bicycle, transporting gasoline, and pay no attention to the fact that he's smoking here. So um, <laughs> not much in terms of safety codes and standards. And we actually had um, a number of different home refueling methods. So we had a gasoline tank, you had a hose, um, and you could refuel at home. In fact, between 1900 and 1915, there were about 70 different home gasoline fueler models on the market. So what history showed is that we had a phased introduction of different fueling methods. We had no concept of today's gasoline station. We had dispersed methods, curb pumps, drive-in stations, and then finally the self-serve stations that we know today. So while states are putting in hydrogen stations, we now have one in DC that we just uh, opened in collaboration with the National Park Service. Um, to fuel our cars that we have here. And California states are, are putting in hydro re regular retail stations. And to complement that, we issued the H Prize 
to allow for a, a smaller option, again, that concept of providing that hydrogen easily accessible, uh, small community fueling, whether it's forklifts or cars. Um, and so we're very excited to um, soon be able to announce the $1 million prize winner. So as we move forward, information sharing is, is really critical. And we launched H2 Tools which is a one-stop shop for sharing hydrogen information. We've trained over 36,000 code officials. Um, you can see the different regions across the country where we're getting uh, most of the interest in terms of the website. And we need to continue um, sharing that information. And we also need to make sure that we um, tell the story in terms of the portfolio approach. So we really need all of the technologies. It's not. Um, only one over the other. It's not an either-or situation. So we need batteries and fuel cells. We need electricity and hydrogen. And we need, we're looking at a number of new options as well. So net zero carbon fuels, taking solar or wind, producing hydrogen. So you can basically take water, apply electricity, split the water to hydrogen and oxygen, combine that hydrogen with um, carbon, with CO2, to produce uh, net zero liquid fuels. So a number of options. And in terms of the newest um, vision that's gaining momentum worldwide, uh, we're calling it here at DOE H2 at scale. Um, and the so-called big idea concept proposed by our national laboratories. Here the concept is you can use renewables um, or other, other technologies, obviously clean technologies for the grid. And you can either uh, continue with, with batteries, which uh, as a means of storage, so electrons to electrons, or you can produce hydrogen. And when the sun is shining, the wind um, is blowing, and then store that hydrogen, either feed it back to the grid, provide real-time grid services, uh, compensate for the intermittency of renewables, or you can inject that into the natural gas pipeline. Some countries are doing that now. Produce that hydrogen for vehicles, um, synthetic fuels, as I mentioned, biomass, number of other approaches that are uh, where hydrogen is needed, such as the ammonia production, industrial applications. Or you can, of course, go directly from those renewables uh, to hydrogen generation. So it's a way to decouple what we think of as in terms of our conventional um, stovepiped sectors. So finally, what can you do to help us? We have, um, as of course everyone on the street knows, hydrogen is the simplest, lightest element. The atomic weight is 1.008. And Congress, believe it or not, introduced National Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Day as October 8th. And um, you can help us by celebrating National Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Day. This past October, we had a National Press Club event. We reached half a million people. Again, people just don't know that much about hydrogen and fuel cells. Um, and I think it's the only element that has its own national day. So. Um, Thank you again for your interest, and please help us to increase your H2 IQ. Thank you. Thank you.